Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar in the CERDEP and ESTCP webinar series. My name is Jennifer Nyman. I am a Principal Engineer at Geosyntec Consultants in Oakland, California, and the coordinator of the webinar series on behalf of CERDEP and ESTCP. I will be facilitating today's call. Today's webinar will consist of a brief overview of CERDEP and ESTCP by Dr. Andrea Leeson followed by a list of upcoming webinars in the series. After Andrea's opening remarks, we will transition to the technical portion of the webinar. Today's event features two speakers describing CERDEP and ESTCP projects focused on the management of energetic and propellant material releases at testing and training ranges. Dr. Elizabeth Ferguson of the U.S. Army Engineer Research and Development Center will begin by presenting an overview of the unique environmental challenges of military lands and research needs to address these challenges. Her presentation will be followed by a brief question and answer session. Next, Dr. Neil Bruce will describe research on phytoremediation of explosive contaminated soil by transgenic grasses, followed by a second question and answer session. We will conclude the webinar with a question and answer session for both speakers. Today's broadcast will be listen only. You may submit questions by using the chat box on the left-hand portion of your screen. You do not need to wait until the question and answer period to submit your questions. And in fact, we encourage you to submit questions in advance of that session. On this slide, we have provided a few suggestions in case you experience difficulties with the broadcast audio. Typically, any delay will be fixed if you refresh your screen or call into the conference line. However, if you do continue to have problems, please submit a comment using the chat box in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. And with that, I would like to introduce Dr. Andrea Leeson, who is the Deputy Director of CERDEP and ESTCP, as well as the Program Manager for Environmental Restoration. Andrea has been with CERDEP and ESTCP since 2001. Before that, Andrea was a research scientist at Battelle Memorial Institute, where she conducted research on in situ bioremediation. Andrea? Thanks, Jennifer, and welcome everyone to today's webinar. Um, before we jump into the technical talks, let me give you a little overview of who we are. Um, we're two sister programs. The first is CERTIP, the Strategic Environmental Research and Development Program. And we were established in 1991 by Congress as a partnership between the DOD, the Department of Energy, and the EPA. And our mission is to identify and address high priority environmental science and technology opportunities that focus on DOD requirements. CERTIP funds both fundamental research as well as advanced technology development and ultimately our goal is to impact real-world environmental management. Our sister program is ESTCP, which is the Environmental Security Technology Certification Program. And in this program, we demonstrate innovative environmental and energy technologies. Our investments here capitalize on past investments under CERTIP or other research programs. And they're designed to transition technologies out of the lab and into the field. Especially important in all ESTCP demonstrations is the ultimate transition to implementation and regulatory acceptance. As I mentioned, CERTIP and ESTCP are complementary programs with much of CERTIP research occurring at the lab and pilot scale with some field efforts, while ESTCP demonstrations are primarily at the pilot and field scale, although occasionally we have supporting lab efforts also. We have four program areas in CERTIP, five in ESTCP. The energy and water program area is only in ESTCP, while the other four, environmental restoration, munitions response, resource conservation and resiliency, and weapons system and platforms are CERTIP and ESTCP programs that are managed jointly by one program manager. Our webinar today is focusing on research and demonstrations that were conducted under the Environmental Restoration Program area. And under this program area, we essentially have five main areas of research, contaminated groundwater, contaminants on DOD testing and training ranges, contaminated sediments, wastewater treatment, and risk assessments. 
Our webinar series will be highlighting research and demonstration efforts from each of the five program areas. And listed here are some of the upcoming webinar series. And as you can see, it covers a really broad range of topics from the zinc, nipple, zinc nickel dip and brush plating next month up to platforms for underwater and nearshore munition surveys later in November. And then our next webinar under the Environmental Restoration Program area will be covering research and development needs for management of our PFAS contaminated sites. And much of what will be presented in this webinar are results from a strategic workshop we held a couple of months ago. You can find more information about upcoming webinars at the link shown here. And rev registration is now live for the webinar through the end of December. I'd like to also mention that I'm very pleased that we will also be holding the CERTIP and ESTCP Symposium again this year. It will be held November 28th through 30th, and it will be at the Washington Hilton Hotel. Registration is now open, so you can go to our website and find links to the registration. So at this point, I'll turn it back to you, Jennifer, and I hope you all enjoy the webinar today. Thank you, Andrea. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Elizabeth Ferguson. Elizabeth serves as an Army Senior Science Technical Manager and Lead Technical Director for the Army Environmental Quality and Installations, or EQI, business area. She also serves as Technical Director of the Military Materials in the Environment, or MME, program at the U.S. Army Engineer Research and Development Center in Mississippi. As lead EQI technical director, Elizabeth is responsible for the programmatic direction of the research areas of adaptive and resilient infrastructure, or the built environment, as well as the natural environment in sustainable ranges and lands and military materials in the environment. As technical director for MME, she leads research and technology development for contaminant impacts, sensing, and remediation. Elizabeth's technical background is in ecological and human health risks. She obtained a bachelor's degree in chemistry, as well as one in psychology, a master's degree in radioanalytical chemistry, and a PhD in, phys in fish physiology and aquatic toxicology from the University of Kentucky. Elizabeth? Thanks, Jennifer. So I'm really pleased to be here today and talk to you a little bit about all the unique environmental challenges that we have on the military lands that we use, and some of the research gaps and some of the research needs that we have on these lands. As you can tell from my background, you know, I, I used to work in risk assessment and work uh, really closely uh, with all the different cleanup projects and, and work that was going on around the country. And now I get to, to have my hand at everybody's research uh, who's within the Corps of Engineers so that I can help direct our, our research towards some of our biggest and, and most pressing needs. So I hope our discussion today will center on some of those needs. So I'm going to move to slide 17, which is the agenda, so what I'm going to talk about. And, you know, I'm, I'm kind of the warm-up band for Dr. Bruce, so I'm really excited about that. But um, I, I want you to get a flavor for how big this problem actually can be, why we care, uh, list out some of those issues so we can start talking about research gaps. And then we'll talk about a few of the really current research gaps. It's, you know, the environmental quality area or environmental restoration area, it's huge. It's really broad. You go from everywhere from um, different types of species on the site and, and their different uh, toxicologies and physiologies and how different chemicals can affect them all the way down to what I consider uh, to be really fun work in some of the newest materials. Now I'll move on for anybody who's following at home to slide 18. And one of the things I wanted to point out was just how big are the DOD lands. And there's about, you know, a little bit less than 5,000 sites. And that's excluding the sites like uh, USACE lands, like uh, core dams and campgrounds and sort of the civil works type mission of the Corps of Engineers. And it doesn't include things like recruiting stations. These are all places that have at least an acre of property associated with them. 
And those are the ones that, you know, really are part of our purview, part of understanding how we impact the environment. Across the, the world, there's about 26 million acres And some of those we own, some we lease, some we just occupy for a period of time. But all of those fall under a DOD instruction that I'll talk about in a few moments. Just within the U.S., we're looking at 11 million acres. Uh, The largest of that's 2.3 million acres, and I believe that one happens to be in New Mexico. If you look at the, the big four states, so, you know, where are our biggest areas? And these are not all contiguous, so some of these are... um, Uh, parcels within a state, but you've got the big lands in New Mexico, which I think the the biggest parcel is there with white sands. You've got two million acres in California, a little over a half million acres in Alaska, and about a half million in Florida as well. So when we're talking about some of these these training lands or these, these DOD lands, now this includes, you know, living space, industrial areas, those sorts of things. So this isn't all just training ranges and lands, but these are the properties and the fence lines that we're responsible for maintaining. Moving on to slide 19, just to break it down a little bit more, particularly because I'm Army, and so I wanted to to really pull in, you know, what are the, the largest Army training ranges? And even though these may be the largest Army training ranges, with the move toward uh, joint training and joint effort, Um, There's a lot of tri-service use, multi-service use uh, throughout all the different uh, bases and installations throughout the DOD. Uh, So you see there's a a ton of ranges. So there's 440-some in in the U.S., 57 that are outside the U.S. Then they range, you know, anywhere from uh, 13.9 total to 200,000 acres. Um, the average area is about 31,000 acres, uh, and there's that, that note that the largest site that's, you know, one contiguous site is White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico. Um, the largest one that's, that's Oconus outside is 39,000 acres uh, over in Germany. So we've got some big parcels of land to deal with, and it's an interesting heterogeneous system. You know, it's it's not uh, all in use at one time. It's not all used for the same thing. Uh, we use it for sometimes, you know, just tank training as moving and, and doing maneuver operations or getting our soldiers from one place to the other. And then sometimes these are, you know, heavy usage firing or, or in the, uh, bombing ranges. Uh, so there's this, this broad suite of activities that we use on these, that we do on these ranges. Moving on to slide 20, the DOD Environmental Program Priorities. This is really, you know, why we, why we do this work, why we have to make sure that we have these lands uh, ready for our use. And, and the, the, biggest, the number one thing in the DOD instruction, of course, is our mission. We have to be able to train. We have to be ready for whatever um, whatever. Uh, problem comes our way. We have to be able to use all of the new equipment and training. We have to get our forces uh, trained up to understand how to use the different pieces of equipment as we develop new pieces of equipment, and then how to work and, and use the, the you know existing pieces of equipment as well. And as you can see from the picture on the side there, uh, you know in a training operation you may have a nice pile of shells that that have to be policed and and picked up uh, after the training operation. But there's also some items that we just can't pick up from that, and that's where we start having uh, some of our environmental issues. Also in the DODI, in in the DOD instruction, there is a line that says, we must protect the health of our military and civilian personnel living and working on bases. Because we have our families there, we have our soldiers training, we have our kids there, and, and we have civilian workforce also coming onto the base. So all of those people, the risk of anything that we use to those people is an important part of understanding our impact on the environment. And then we don't just stop at the, the fence line because 
you know, chemicals don't really pay attention to fence lines. They, uh, they don't seem to be constrained at all. So we have to be able to not ad- adversely impact our surrounding communities at all. We have to make sure that nothing is getting off in surface water, into groundwater and moving off base, um, moving out through uh, animals that may have picked up um, a contaminant while they're out uh, foraging on the training ranges. So we have to make sure that our sound- surrounding communities are also um, protected from any of our activities. And then we also need to preserve these resources for future generations um, and protecting them for future soldier generations. We have to keep training on these ranges. And we have to keep training often at higher and higher tempos. So we're putting more soldiers or different types of training onto our ranges. And so we have to be very adaptive about how we're looking at the ranges and how we're assessing uh, the impacts that we might have on our ranges. Moving on down to page 21. So what are some of the critical environmental issues for us? I mean, we train and we work and our ranges exist in all of these different ecosystems, you know, heavily vegetated through more desert uh, type ecosystems and like the National Training Center in California, all the way into some some sub-Arctic and and, um, lower Arctic type training ranges that we have in Alaska. So we move and we train and we work in all of these different areas just within the United States. And so some of the the big things that, that, you know, really impact the DOD and our DOD lands, uh, first and foremost, you know, on this list, and they're not by, uh, and I say first and foremost, but this is just sort of a random my brainstorming of the different issues. We have the the threatened and endangered species. And so, you know, as part of our uh, DOD requirements and the federal law, we will work to maintain and protect the threatened and endangered species who call our ranges home. And with the number of acres that we have, this is a significant uh, number of of species. Um, when you look at the DOD, I, when you look at the DOD land, you see that we have you know, multiple sets of acres that are un, unoccupied at given times, and the species like to move into those areas. Um, and so we've got a good number. In fact, some people say we have more than the, the National Park Service and several other uh, of the federal agencies that have large land tracts. We um, We're trying to make sure that we don't have munitions restrictions on any of our lands. Part of our readiness is understanding and being able to use any type of weapon system at any given time. And some of the issues that that we can have with different munition systems is, you know, types of things like on the next column, on the second column, like noise restrictions. As people move in closer to the ranges or, or as we're on our ranges, we have to deal with some of the noise restrictions Uh, that are in place. And within the U.S., this is an issue in other countries where we also train, there can be even more um, restrictive noise uh, noise code uh, than we face here in the United States. The spectrum of operations, as I mentioned, when we train, we train, you know, across a broad area. And sometimes we have the joint training. So you may have um, an aerial dropping of munitions, or uh, a, a, um, a dismounted troops uh, working within a, a, a close area, actually. We have to maintain our maritime sustainability. We have to keep our ports and harbors open so that we can move our Navy ships in and around. We also have to be able to move you know, Army boats uh, around and in some of the freshwater-type areas. Airspace is always an area. It seems like it's getting more and more congested every day. Um, and so being able to fly in, in, in the open space uh, where we can perform the maneuvers that we might need to train in uh, is an issue. Air quality is an issue, particularly for as we're, we're moving or around our industrial air uh, aspects, so like our Army ammunition plants. Um, 
paying quite a bit of attention to open burn, open detonation, um, and that, that's what we use to get rid of solid waste or decommission various types of munitions items. I mentioned the noise restrictions. One of our, our big issues on some of the bases is the adjacent land use. So what are people, what are our neighbors doing around us? What is the community doing around us? And I'll hit on this in the next slide or two, but we've got a lot of areas where the community has been, moved, has been growing and developing, which is fantastic. But as they grow and develop, sometimes they're pushing in on the training ranges. And it causes tension. And, you know, and it's very similar to other industrial or even airport issues where a community grows in around them, and then there's tensions that arise. We pay a significant amount of attention to our cultural resources. The lands that the Army owns, some of them are, are dated uh, quite a bit back, so we've had them for at least 100 years. And with on those, on those we, we do pay significant attention to all the different cultural resources that um, exist on the site and protect those um, throughout even training range areas. For water quality and supply, we're constantly monitoring and we've maintained the National Environmental Pollutant Discharge Permits um, and do regular monitoring on all of our facilities um, because we want to protect those communities around us. And we know that our, our items don't stop at the fence line if anything gets out. Just like anybody else, we have wetland regulation that we have to maintain. We also know that there's, there's great hunting on some of our ranges. And so every once in a while, people disregard the fences and, and the warning signs and move out to, uh, to have sort of open and, and unrestricted hunting, um, which of course is highly discouraged. And, um, and so we have to watch out for the folks who you know, trespass uh, for various reasons onto our ranges. And then you know, finally, we have to look to the future and how our ranges are going to be situated, how they're going to be organized if we have some type of change in climate. So if we have sea level rise, how does that impact our Navy ports and harbors and our naval bases that are stationed around the edges or around the uh, coastal areas of our country? If you look more interior, um, and let's say someplace like Fort Drum, uh, that's in upstate New York and wonderful location. But if you have some of the climate change scenarios that happen with, from the, the various um, predictions from the International uh, Panel on Climate Change, you start seeing a real change in vegetation and in weather patterns. One of the, the less obvious maybe impacts of that is a move of uh, the deer tick from a, a more southern geography up into the, the upper New York State area. And with that, you now have soldiers and epidemiology issues with Lyme disease. And so now you're going to have to be much more vigilant about deer tick and, and so on during training exercises. So climate change can impact a, a broad swath of, of things from whether the, the landscape still looks like it did, whether it's still an optimum training zone, uh, one of the things for contaminants that, that I think is out there is uh, as you change biomes, as the biology changes in a site. So let's take Fort Campbell, uh, Kentucky. It, it's right on the Kentucky-Tennessee border, border. Part of it's in Kentucky and part of it's in Tennessee. It's sort of a, an area with uh, oak trees, sort of your... Um, deep forested area, but as some of the, the climate change scenarios predict, in about 100 years or so, you'd be looking at longleaf pine. You'd be looking at a different ecosystem. That's a much more acidic type of ecosystem. So the soil acidity would be expected to change, and then you might have a significant difference in the way contaminants and chemicals move through the soils uh, if you change the, the soil pH. So climate change can, can really impact things from whether we can train there to how our, the types of impacts we have on the lands uh, differentiate between ecosystems all the way up to uh, issues, medical issues, for troops training on those lands. 
So it's a, a really unique and um, interesting topic, but, but very, very broad. Moving on to slide 22, uh, the encroachment issues. I've really hit on this a good bit, but Army lands are a fantastic area for critters to exist. Uh, we create these islands, and as communities move in on us, um, they, there's a break in the pathways, especially for migratory or animals or animals with very large land use uh, or habit, habitats. Um, the, the areas, you know, the, the three mission areas for the military, we, we move, we maneuver, we, we, there's fire, so we, we shoot things, um, and, and we want to sustain all of those items. On slide 23, I'm showing just, you know, one example of where the military is working to buy out some properties to extend our area so that we can create a buffer zone due to our desires to increase, um, they, they want to build a, a, um, a, an air, a, a runway there, another runway. Um, and so that's going to impact, and you see up in the upper left-hand corner, there's a significant interstate and then some significant roadways around that as well. So the crime uh, business and, and, and uh, economic area, um, but we're working to, to build that buffer zone. Moving on down to slide 24. I want to get into some of the things that are new and different. What's impacting our DOD lands? Uh, first and foremost, we're developing some new and sensitive munitions. These are munitions that um, it currently are more of a nitro ring. And these lands are, or these uh, chemicals, um, they, they're more stable, so they, they don't go boom when you don't want them to. Uh, so you can burn them and they actually melt instead of explode. As we're looking at longer range fires, as we're looking at munitions that can travel a, a longer distance, then we're looking at some new propellant compounds. These will all be novel as we, as we train on these lands. We're using nanomaterials and other composites and polymers more than ever before, taking away some of the, the uncertainties and some of the metal casings that we use for our munitions items and using more targeted, very point-specific polymers and advanced composites so that we can basically tune our munitions to do what we want them to do, to, um, to be directional. We're working with and, and training our soldiers in in situ manufacturing and additive materials. So providing a Connex container where the soldier can re, remake a part right there in the field instead of sending a huge supply chain behind them of actual parts. Of course, that creates its own supply chain of items to make that part. Um, but it provides an on-the-spot logistics workshop um, but what are the impacts of some of those things? As you look at uh, some of the additive manufacturing methodologies, the OSHA um, rules and, and issues haven't been fully studied. And so we're looking at the ones that are very specific to the soldier. Along with this, it's always important to be able to see what the enemy can't see and to be able to see through what the enemy is, is trying to use. With that, we've got novel smokes and obscurants, and some of those have nanoparticles, so it feeds back into the nanos, nanomaterial uh, studies. But what are the impacts of those smokes and obscurants? Because they have a very broad um, distribution. And then what happens in a new environment? Within the military, we're looking at where is the next battlefield? And it could be one of these very large developed megacities or dense urban areas. And even those are very, very different. The one on the left on page on slide 25 shows a very developed, you know, first world type uh, situation. But there's also situations where you're in a more third world type country, and you're looking at just a mishmash of water and pollution control, air quality, all of these things that now become our our area of operation and areas in which we need to train and investigate. So some of the research gaps are listed here, the extreme environments I talked about, climate impacts on those, all those novel materials and technologies, 
different assessment tools as we look at new environments like a megacity. How do you even assess? How do you do a risk assessment for a soldier on what they're going to encounter in that situation when you add military-type um, chemicals into the mix with a large city and, and some of the, the contaminants of just being in a big city? New threatened and endangered species management, new remediation tools. Some of these technologies right now we don't even have good analytical tools. How do you find a carbon nanotube in a carbon-based environment? Computational simulation is important to bring down costs. So we've got a, a lot of different uh, research gaps that are out there. We have huge federal lands that we have to take care of. And, and the purpose and, the, and the, the training impacts, the impacts that we have on our lands are significant and broad. And with that, I'll move to slide 28, which I believe is my uh, contact if you have any questions. Jennifer, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth, for the, the great background and the overview presentation. And at this time, I would like to remind our audience to submit questions for Elizabeth um, in the chat box. So in the lower left-hand corner of your screen, you'll see a place where you can um, type in a question. We do have a few questions for Elizabeth. Um, the first question is, um, what are the typical or the, the most common chemical contaminants on military lands? On military lands, the, the most common contaminants you'll see, um, and, and what we're doing the, the biggest load of our remediation, is it's in the, the, what we call the legacy uh, high explosives, so TNT and RDX. Um, and those are, are followed by some of the, the various um, aspects of the HMX and some of the breakdown products of TNT, RDX, and, and Composition B, which is a mixture of, the, of those two. But we also have metals, um, and those are, you know, dust from at firing lines. Those are aspects of munitions, casings from, from long ago. Um, and so we're, we're looking at that, as well as lead. Lead's always an issue, um, and it's particularly from historical uh, shooting ranges. And concentrations really vary. So around a target, if it's been a long-term fixed target, uh, then the concentrations can be you know, much, much greater. And it, and it varies from non-detect all the way up to parts per thousands or, or parts per hundred. Um, and the, then, you know, as we're going into more adaptive ranges, so ranges where the targets change more often, uh, you'll see a significant less, uh, less of a hot spot. Uh, and you'll see a, a hot spot that's, that's uh, centered where all the different targets are, are being uh, deployed. Thank you, Elizabeth. And can you comment on how the, the loadings or the mass of contaminants are changing um, over time on military lands right now? Sure. Um, that's, that's always an interesting one. Uh, and it kind of goes back to where I sort of ended that last answer. In past um, training range doctrine, targets were fixed. And so um, my husband, who was a soldier, you know, would say, oh, yeah, we're going back to that range. We know exactly where every target is. And, and so military, you know, figured this out and said, oh, wait a second. The soldiers need more adaptive training. They need to have these changes. They can't memorize these forces. And so they, they came in with some, some really neat adaptive courses where the targets are much more mobile. And so with those courses, the, the loading onto the, the ranges uh, has become less of a point source and, and more spread out. And also over time, as we've done base, base relocation and closures, um, as we've closed ranges, we still have the same training needs. And sometimes we've, we've had more training needs. And if we continue to increase the the number of soldiers, um, as is in the current administration's um, di uh, dialogue anyway, then we're going to have more soldiers training on smaller 
acres, on some smaller numbers of acres. And so at that point, you're going to see a much heavier loading. And the question is going to be, you know, um, will the remediation technology that we have in place be able to, um, to hold back some of that contaminant load? Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, would you please comment on the significance of uh, potential pollution from open detonations? And an audience member is referencing um, an article uh, from the Army from a few years ago in bringing up this topic. Okay. <sighs> so it, within open, det uh, open detonation and open burn, um, we've been working heavily to understand uh, the sort of the diameter of the detonation and, and the different products that spill out. Uh, one of the great projects uh, of the last few years, they had an, uh, an open detonation in a snowy area and then collected all the snow and melted that out so that they could discover, you know, what were the detonation products and spell that out and put that out in the literature. It's still one of the most interesting ways to understand the, the contaminant loading from a detonation event. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, the next question is about remedial goals. How does DOD approach um, determining appropriate remedial goals when state requirements might differ from federal requirements? Mm. That's a good question. And really, it's been on a site-by-site -site effort and a lot of dialogue and discussion. Um, I, I look back to the days when I was a risk assessor um, working on some of the different Army sites, and it really had to be a deep discussion about the site, background concentrations um, <laughs> with explosives. Okay, there aren't any background concentrations that are natural, but within metals and, and other um, chemicals of concern, there can be background concentrations that have to be discussed, and each area is very specific. But the thing that I found uh, through the activities that, that I actually you know, had a role in was that dialogue and actually getting out on the site and looking around was possibly one of the most important things. As I was looking and, and being part of some of the re these remediations, I really came to understand that a re remediation is a really messy and destructive event. You really have to get in and impact the soil, and that impacts the ecosystem. So one of the things that, that I was paying attention to in the state and the federal regulators that I got the opportunity to work with was, are we having an impact? What is the impact, and how do we fix that? Um, and that's one of the things I think is most important in looking at remediation goals. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, the next question from the audience is about um, changing areas of combat. So will the change to different types of combat areas, so for example, moving more into urban areas, affect the type and, and, uh, and extent of range contaminants? You know, I think we'll still be training with our, our different munitions items and our different weapon systems on the open range. So within our training ranges, I don't think we'll see any major changes except in the types of um, explosives or types of materials that we're using. What I do see is a shift in training ranges to try and mimic um, and understand how um, how to train in these in these urban areas? So creating training ranges that are small, compact cities within our training ranges, and I think some lands will be used as that. Uh, within that, you know, the targets and so on will be interesting. It'll it'll be unique to see how building materials and how the built environment um, impedes or um, possibly speeds. Uh, different transport mechanisms for chemicals uh, as they move across concrete or or through a, um, a washout area or something along those lines. Thank you. And can you comment, Elizabeth, 
on if there is another um, closure round of bases, how would that impact uh, the remaining DOD lands? No, oh, good question. Yeah, I, I, we still have the same, well, we have the current number of soldiers, and we have the policy of looking for more soldiers uh, from our current administration. So you're going to be looking at training more people on smaller number of acres. So you are going to see more loading, um, and it's probably, I would expect it to be relatively proportional to uh, the you know, current loading across our land. So I, as you increase the number of soldiers, I think we'll see an increased loading. With that's going to have, you know, have to be remediation technologies that are at the point ready to um, address any of the impacts that we have on our land. Thank you. And we have time for one or two last questions. Um, we have a question about um, remediation. Uh, would you please comment on the difference between the remediation of cleanup sites um, versus actions that might be taken on a range to address munitions constituents? Are there some major differences between the two? Sorry, I just had an interruption. Would you repeat the question? Yeah, absolutely. Um, could you comment on the difference between the remediation of cleanup sites versus um, the types of actions that might be taken on a range? to address munitions constituents? Yeah, yeah, good question. So, you know, on a, on a closed site where you don't have active training going on, um, you, you've got a much more significant uh, capability to perform remediation techniques and, and put, input, put technologies into place. When you're looking at an active range, you, you still have soldiers training. If we have you know, a decrease in training ranges, we have to be able to train more soldiers, which may be, you know, less time. With that, I believe that an active range has to have remediation that's around in a buffer around the edges of the training range, which means we're going to have to design our training ranges to shuffle the contaminants that we have into a specific area. I think that's a doable thing as you work to redesign ranges for the future force, I think you can do the landscaping required. I think we have an understanding of chemicals and how they move, or at least I hope we do, to, to, to shuttle those contaminants or, or chemicals of concern uh, to an area where they can be remediated at the very edge of the training range. Thank you very much, Elizabeth, for the presentation and for answering uh, questions from the audience. And um, as a reminder to the audience, Elizabeth will return at the end of the webinar for some more general questions. So if you have additional questions for her, please feel free to um, ask those in the chat box. The next part of the webinar will be presented by Dr. Neil Bruce. Neil is a professor in the Center for Novel Agricultural Products at the University of, New of York in the United Kingdom. His research focuses on plant and microbial metabolism of xenobiotic compounds with in-depth structural analysis and characterization of the enzymes mediating these metabolic processes. He has discovered a diverse range of enzymes with environmental and industrial biotechnology applications. Neil has co-authored over 140 peer-reviewed papers and book chapters. He earned a bachelor's degree from the University of Hertfordshire in 1983 and a doctorate from the University of Kent in 1987. Neil? Thank you, Jennifer. Um, so I'm going to uh, talk to you today about um, phytoremediation of explosives contaminated soil um, by transgenic grass. So if we could move to slide 31. I'd like to first of all give you an outline of, uh, of my presentation. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, the problem of explosives pollution in the environment and an idea of scale of the problem. Um, explosives are toxic to plants, um, particularly TNT, and uh, I'm going to tell you about some of the work we've been doing to elucidate the um, mechanisms of toxicity of TNT in plants, but also how we've been elucidating and exploring the mechanisms that plants use to uh, detoxify TNT. And then my group has also over the years been looking at the microbial degradation of, uh, of explosives, 
and I'll tell you something about the work we've been doing on the microbial degradation of RDX. And then how we've been using this sort of fundamental information to um, um, the, the sort of fundamental understanding that we've been gaining on the uh, plant metabolism of explosives and the microbial metabolism of explosives to uh, genetically engineer robust plant species that have the capability of remediating uh, explosives on contaminated sites. And I'll also tell you about um, the work that's currently ongoing where we're um, um, testing uh, these uh, plants uh, in field plots on a military site in, uh, in the States. So if we move on to slide 32. So the problem, um, RDX and, uh, and TRT, uh, and TNT are the, um, uh, historically the um, major explosives that have been used by the military. Um, TNT has been used for over 100 years and on RDX for you know, 60 to 70 years. So large amounts of, of these materials have made their way into the environment. And um, they are proving to be particularly recalcitrant to biodegradation. So they persist for a long period of time. And these explosives are toxic. So TNT in particular is, is highly toxic to microorganisms, it's toxic to plants, it's toxic to um, aquatic life, and it's toxic to mammals. And in humans, TNT is known to cause red blood cell abnormalities and liver dysfunction, and it's a potent carcinogen. And indeed, during the um, First and Second World Wars, um, hundreds of uh, munition workers, who are mainly women, um, died through uh, exposure to TNT. So as I mentioned, large amounts of, of these compounds have made their way into the environment over the years. Historically, um, this has occurred through the manufacture of explosives, but the challenge we face now is that there is significant pollution on military training ranges. And this problem occurs because when a bomb or, or mortar round um, explodes, um, particularly if it's a low detonation, you never get complete detonation of all the explosives that are present. So you end up with um, particles of explosives spread over large areas of land. And these, these particles are very small, so therefore they have a large surface area. And when it rains, these dissolve, and they migrate through the soil and can go on to uh, contaminate groundwater supplies. So um, with, um, with TNT, this tends to stay at the site of contamination. Uh, it's a very hydrophobic molecule, so it binds tightly to clay and organic um, components in the soil. But RDX is much more polar, and so it will tend to migrate through the soil and, uh, and contaminate um, groundwater. And the problem is, as Elizabeth mentioned, with um, communities now sort of um, encroaching upon um, um, areas close to military ranges, the, the, this contamination could go on and contaminate drinking water supplies, uh, as has been seen at the Massachusetts mili Military Reservation. So there, there are plumes of... Um, Explosives pollution um, um, contaminating the sole source aquifer uh, in the Cape Cod region. So there's a, a, a real need to um, develop um, low-cost, sustainable technologies that can um, contain and ideally remediate explosives pollutions, particularly on, on active ranges. And we believe that plants um, offer this capability. So um, if we move on to slide 33... Um, plants have a remarkable ability to extract compounds um, from the air, from soil, and from water. Uh, and they'll take them up through their roots, they'll translocate them into the aerial parts of the plants. Um, and plants, you know, being bombarded on a daily basis by toxic compounds. And so they've evolved their own innate defense mechanisms. They've got enzymes that can uh, um, degrade um, 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 xenobiotic compounds. And these can be often applied to various types of pollution. Plants also detoxify chemicals by transforming them and then sequestering them in the cell walls or in the vacuole so they're no longer toxic to the plant. And plants will also um, exude um, um, nutrients into the soil that stimulate microorganisms uh, in their rhizosphere so you get larger um, numbers of microorganisms in the root zones of plants. Uh, and they can, of course, can also contribute to um, the degradation of, of pollutants. So in terms of advantages, you know, plants are low maintenance, they, they're minimally disruptive, uh, they're cost effective, they're aesthetically pleasing, and um, they're compatible with restoration ecology. Of course, there are disadvantages. Um, plants are limited by their root depth in terms of phytoremediation. 
Um, also, your dependence on geographical regions and, and climate and soil types. Um, and of course, one of the major disadvantages is if the plants don't have any enzyme activities that are active towards the pollutant you're concerned with, or if the pollutant is highly toxic to the plant, then um, um, this is obviously going to be challenging. So if we move on to slide 34, um, this is some work that's done by um, um, Jerry Schnorr at uh, the University of Iowa. And what he did was he radio labeled RDX and TNT and looked at the uptake of uh, these explosives in plants. And um, you can see that RDX uh, moves up through the roots into the aerial parts of the plant. You can see the beautiful definition there of the leaves. And the plants will quite rapidly take up RDX, but they become saturated. And so they, they're unable to take um, up any more RDX. And then when the plant senesces, the um, leaf material um, is then broken down, and the RDX is then returned to the soil. So these plants um, have very limited metabolic activity towards RDX. So you get very limited degradation of RDX. Now, if you look at the... Um, um, uh, the image of, t of the TNT um, uptake in plants, you can see, interestingly, it's just restricted to, um, to the roots. It doesn't get up into the aerial parts of the plant. And in fact, plants do have an innate ability to detoxify TNT at very low concentrations. And we were particularly interested in finding out the mechanisms by which plants do this. So the question we posed ourselves was, is it possible to engineer plants to improve their ability to break down or remove um, uh, exposures from contaminated soil. So if we move on to slide 35, you get a, a, a clear indication here of how um, toxic TNT is to plants. So in that image in the top left-hand corner, you've got um, a, a plant species, Arabidopsis, a model plant species that we use in the lab, growing in contaminated soil. And you can see that the wild-type plants are incredibly, are, are, are are stunted um, in um, soil just containing 100 milligrams of TNT uh, per kilogram of soil. And, and this is a sort of concentration of TNT that you can find on, a, on an active military range. Um, so to get an eye to try and elucidate why and determine why TNT is so toxic to plants, we screened a mutant library of Arabidopsis plants um, with, um, with TNT, see if we could find a mutant line that was much more resistant to TNT. And that's what you can see on the right-hand side there. Um, there is, there is a, a mutation in a gene called MDHR6 that allows plants to um, resist the toxic, toxicity of TNT um, at much, much higher concentrations than wild-type plants. And you can also clearly see that in the length of roots of the wild-type plants and these, this mutant line in, in, um, when it's been exposed to 15 micromolar TNT. So that's a really very low concentration of TNT. So what is it then that, um, that's causing um, um, this resistance to TNT when, it's, when this gene is mutated? So the gene MDHR6 encodes for an enzyme called monodehydroascorbate reductase that's present um, specifically in plants and is found in the mitochondria. And to determine what activity this enzyme was catalyzing, um, we, we took the gene, we cloned it, we expressed it, and we found that that enzyme was active against TNT and converts TNT to a nitro radical in the mitochondria. And that nitro radical, so it's a one electron reduction, that nitro group is reduced to a nitro radical, and then that reacts with molecular oxygen and it forms then reactive oxygen species. And these are very damaging to cells and cellular structures. But what happens when that nitro radical reacts with oxygen to produce those reactive oxygen species is that it's returned back to TNT. And TNT then is, reacts with the enzyme to produce another nitro radical. So you have this cycle going round and round and round. You just need catalytic, quanti catalytic quantities of TNT to generate large quantities of reactive oxygen species. So this is a very important finding because um, you can now go on to breed plants that are much more tolerant and resistant to TNT for phytoremediation applications. So if we move on to slide 36, 
Um, if you remember that image of the TNT in the roots of, uh, of those poplar plant that's in, in the earlier slide, we wanted to find, find out how, how the plant was um, localizing the TNT there. And the way we did this was to do some transcriptomics. So we exposed the plants to TNT to see what genes were expressed. And then we um, were able to identify potential enzymes that would have activity towards TNT. We then cloned them and expressed them and looked for that activity. And we elucidated two main pathways so far um, for um, detoxification of TNT in plants. So that first one in the top right-hand corner is where an enzyme, a nitroreductase, um, uh, reduces the nitro group of TNT to produce hydroxyl amino or amino derivatives of TNT. And that adds functionality to the molecule which the plant can recognize. So the plant then conjugates a sugar molecule, a glucose molecule, to um, these TNT metabolites. And that then allows the plant to sequester these toxic metabolites in the plant cell wall so, it, so they're out of harm's way, so they're no longer toxic to the plant. And then there's another mechanism which also involves conjugation of another hydrophilic molecule, which is called glutathione, directly to the TNT molecule. And then that glutathione conjugate can then be sequestered in the vacuole. So this was, again, an these were important findings because it allows us to go on and breed plants in a non-GM way to produce um, more uh, um, robust and uh, um, more efficient plants to um, remove TNT from contaminated soil. But we've also made transgenic lines. So it, it, we can then take the genes of these enzymes and overexpress them in plants. And this is really incredibly in effective. So in those flasks you can see in the, in the liquid culture, you can see plants. WT is the unmodified wild type plant. And then the NR, OPR are the transgenic line that has the nitroreductase, the reaction you can see in the top right hand corner the enzyme responsible for that um, expressed in the plant. So when you've got uh, 250 micromolar TNT in the medium there, you can see that the wild type plant, the unmodified plant, is dead. It's chlorotic. It's hardly removed any of the TNT from the medium. Whereas the modified line has increased in biomass. It's green. It's healthy. And importantly, it's removed all the TNT from that medium. And um, this is so effective that it will actually do it at pretty much saturation concentrations of TNT. And these lines are also very effective at removing TNT, not just from, from water, but from soil as well. And also we've shown that overexpression of the enzymes that conjugate glutathione to TNT molecules also has uh, an incredible effect um, on these plants to allow them to remove um, high concentrations of TNT from contaminated soil. So moving on to slide 37, you remember um, earlier I mentioned that plants will readily take up RDX into the aerial parts of plants, but um, they don't have um, the ability to degrade RDX, or that uh, ability is very, very limited. So we've also, over the years, been looking at uh, microorganisms that degrade explosives. So we've been going out to contaminated sites that are heavily contaminated with RDX. The image you can see there is, a, is an old D-mill site at a, a UK MOD um, facility. And we do selective enrichment. So soil is generally nitrogen limited. There's a lot of nitrogen in explosives. And so if a bacterium could evolve to get at that nitrogen, it then has a selective advantage. And um, we and others have isolated now bacteria that will grow on RDX as a sole nitrogen source for growth. And you can see on that slide, um, on that image on the left-hand side, um, these bacterial colonies growing on an agar plate. And RDX is not very soluble, so it's opaque. But around the um, colonies, you can see zones of clearance where the microorganism has, uh, has degraded the RDX. And we identified the enzyme that allows microorganisms to do this. So if we move on to slide 38, um, it's a very unusual enzyme that's evolved to allow microorganisms to metabolize RDX. Um, and we've called this enzyme XPLA. It's unusual structurally, and I won't go into the, into the, the, the biochemistry um, or, or, or the structural biology in any great detail. But um, this enzyme is unusual. It's a cytochrome P450 which is a ubiquitous uh, family of enzymes. But these uh, enzymes normally use molecular oxygen in their reaction, um, whereas XPLA reductively, um, doesn't use oxygen, it reductively 
um, removes nitro groups from the RDX molecule, um, which then forms an unstable inter intermediate that then falls apart to release nitrite, um, uh, formaldehyde, and um, some breakdown products that are, are readily biodegradable. Um, there's a second enzyme that's involved, a partnering enzyme, which we call XPLB. And XPLB takes electrons from the cofactor NADPH, which reduces then the, the P450, which then goes on to reduce the RDX. It's a fantastic enzyme for bioremediation because it's just a single enzymatic step that allows this um, recalcitrant toxic molecule to, um, to, to, to break down to um, metabolizable intermediates. So it's the nitrite that's released that the microorganisms are using as a nitrogen source for growth. So therefore, we asked the question, could we take these genes for XPLA and XPLB and express them in plants along with our um, TNT detoxifying enzymes to produce robust plant species that could remove um, con uh, exposes contamination from, from, uh, from soil? So if we move on to slide 39, so we express those genes in our model plant species, Arabidopsis. And in that top left image, you can see um, flasks containing liquid medium that have both TNT and RDX. And um, you can see that the wild type, the unmodified line, is, is, um, is chlorotic. It's dead because of the TNT toxicity. The second flask that contains the RDX degrading genes, you can see is dead, chlorotic, because of the TNT toxicity. Then the third one is the transgenic line containing the TNT detoxifying enzyme, the nitroreductase. You can see the plant that's are, are, uh, green and healthy. And if you look at the graph, the bottom graph, you can see in blue that those plants have removed in a relatively quick uh, period of time all the TNT from the liquid medium. And if you look at the final slide, uh, final, sorry, the final flask, um, you can see that there's, uh, um, the, the plants are green and healthy. And if you look at the graph, you can see that the TNT has been removed. And if you look at the, the top graph, you can see that after the TNT has gone, that all the um, RDX has then been removed from the, the medium. And these plants will do it in soil, and that's what the image in the bottom left shows. But what I'd really like to point out from that image, if you look at the, the, the um, um, uh, pots in the middle um, lane, you can, uh, um, this is containing 250 milligrams of RDX and TNT per kilogram of soil. You can see on the far right there that the multiple transgenic has produced much, much more biomass than um, the line that just contains the nitroreductase that's detoxifying the TNT. And part of the reason for this is, of course, is that this enzyme, XPLA, is degrading RDX in the plants, and it's releasing nitrite and the plant can use the nitrite as a nitrogen source for growth. So it's therefore not just removing the RDX, it's actually of benefit to the plant because it's using it as a, as a fertilizer for growth. So if we move on to slide 40. So this was um, an important experiment for us because it kind of crudely mimics what we're hoping to achieve on um, military ranges. So we've got pots here that contain pristine soil. And we then watered in uh, RDX, we left it for, for, uh, for seven days, and then we watered the RDX through and measured the concentration of RDX in the leachate. And as you'll see from the, the, um, the graph on the right-hand side, uh, the non-plant control and the pot containing the wild-type plants, there was very limited, there was, there was no um, uh, removal of, uh, of RDX from, uh, from the leachate, whereas if you compare it to the the best transgenic lines on the right-hand side there, you can see that after seven days, there was barely any detectable RDX in the leachate. So that was a very important finding for us. So if we move to slide 41, um, Arabidopsis is a model plant species. It really isn't uh, a suitable plant to use um, on, on military sites for explosives remediation. So we've, we decided to use um, plants that were much more appropriate We've, um, in particular, we focused our efforts on grasses. And so uh, our colleagues at uh, the University of Washington, Stuart Strand and Long Zhang, um, took the genes that we'd expressed in Arabidopsis and, um, and went on to uh, express these in a number of grass species, but I'm just going to talk to you about switchgrass 
Um, importantly, they had to then uh, develop vector systems to, uh, to allow this, um, to allow gene expression in grasses, because grasses are monocots compared to uh, Arabidopsis, which is an icops. But they achieved this and uh, successfully got expression of XPLA and XPLB. And um, uh, the, what the graph on the right-hand side shows you is that uh, to test the functionality of these um, enzymes in switchgrass, they did similar experiments in liquid culture, and these grasses would um, um, remove um, uh, RDX from the medium. And importantly, uh, the, as you can see in the bottom right there of the graph, the wild-type tissue contains RDX, whereas the transgenic lines have um, um, no RDX that could be detected. So switchgrass is, um, uh, has a number of um, attributes which make it um, uh, good for, uh, for use on military ranges. Um, they produce den root, dense root systems, uh, and so uh, they um, uh, have ability to uh, you know, have large surface area, so ability to extract um, significant quantities of, uh, of RDX from soil. Um, they also are able to grow over um, a wide range of geographical regions that are um, are suitable for many um, um, U.S. military ranges. So if we move on to slide 42, we needed to demonstrate that these switch grasses would um, um, be, be able to remove explosives pollutants from soil. So uh, they carried out um, um, some experiments uh, in soil microcosms. And these are very similar to the ones that I showed you before with Arabidopsis. So you've got pristine soil, which is a mixture, in this case, of gravel and sand. Um, RDX is then watered into the soil. Um, it's, the, uh, it's left there for a period of time. And then the um, RDX is then watered through, and the concentration of RDX is then measured in the leachate. And you can see quite clearly from the graphs in the bottom left-hand corners that um, uh, the, the wild-type plants um, you can see that there's significant the concentrations of RDX in the leachate, um, whereas in, with the transgenic plant lines, that there's no detectable um, RDX in the leachate. And importantly, again, when you look at the tissue concentrations of RDX, there are significant concentrations of RDX in the unmodified plant lines, whereas the transgenic lines have barely any, any detectable RDX. So moving on to um, slide 43, we... Um, we were concerned that um, because these plants are so effective at degrading RDX, the nitrogen concentration would be much higher and that these plant lines would be um, more desirable to herbivores. So we did some herbivory um, and feeding um, experiments using uh, locust as a general herbivore. And um, we um, gave them leaf blades of switchgrass that had been uh, modified with the RDX degrading genes and also unmodified. Um, plants um, that have been exposed to RDX uh, and, um, and then looked to see um, uh, how much of the leaf material was um, um, uh, eaten over, over a period of time. So we looked to see, uh, so once 50% um, of the material had been removed, we then um, uh, used image analysis to, to uh, compare the amount that had been eaten by the locusts um, um, with each of those different um, um, preferences. And importantly, if we go on to slide 44, what we found was that the uh, uh, locusts had showed no preference for leaves, whether they've been exposed to RDX or not exposed to RDX, or whether they were unmodified or whether they were transgenic lines. So that was a, an important finding for us. So if we move on to slide um, 45, so we'd shown that these grasses were effective and worked well in greenhouse studies. Um, we wanted to go on and do um, field trials. So um, we were able to get a permit from, um, from APHIS of the USDA to carry out these trials. And our colleagues at Erdic um, propagated the plant lines, produced uh, uh, many clones so that we could um, then uh, uh, carry out our trials. So if we move on to slide 46, You'll see a cross-section of our field plots. Um, so these plots are three meters by three meters. They're about a meter deep. They have about 250 centimeters of sand in the bottom and then uh, uh, a layer of soil. Um, we have lysimeters in there to be able to take um, water samples. 
and uh, a culvert with a pump in there so that we can maintain um, constant um, water levels. And uh, then the RDX was applied once the, the plants have been established. RDX was applied um, by being mixed with sand to um, mimic what would be a pr um, um, found on, on a military range. So we move on to slide 47. You can see the construction of the, of the field plots. Um, you can see an aerial view there of our plots. There's 27 plots. This is on a, on a military site in the States. Um, those plots have con uh, non-plant controls, wild-type plant controls, and um, we've got three independent transgenic lines and a number of replicates there as well. So these trials are, are currently ongoing. So if you move to slide 48, we've been taking samples from leaf, soil, and water, um, and these samples are being analyzed for RDX levels. Um, the plants went into the ground last summer and uh, were dormant over the winter, and the trials are currently continuing um, at, at the moment. So if we move on to slide 49. So just to summarize um, what I've presented, um, RDX and TNT are major pollutants on military ranges, and RDX can move off range in groundwater. We've developed transgenic plants that can remove RDX and TNT from soil, preventing leaching to groundwater. We have successfully demonstrated this technology in greenhouse studies. Um, we've been granted a permit by the USDA for our field trials, which are currently uh, underway at a military site in the States. Uh, in terms of DOD benefits, on slide 50, um, this technology has the potential to provide self-sustaining, inexpensive, and environmentally uh, friendly method of range restoration that can be used over large areas of land to prevent groundwater contamination. This technology will allow a land to remain in use with limited closure to military activities. And uh, specific areas that can benefit from this technology are wide ranging, include firing points, impact areas, manufacturing sites, and uh, demolition areas. And finally, on slide 51, uh, I would just like to acknowledge my co-workers, my colleague Liz Rylett at the University of York, um, Stuart Strand and Long Zhang at the University of Washington, and Tim Carey and uh, Tony Palazzo at, uh, at Erdic. Thank you. Okay, hey, thank you very much, Neil. We have received a number of questions from the audience. And at this time, I would like to remind our audience to um, please submit any other questions that you have at this time for, um, for Neil uh, in the chat box in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. The first question for you, Neil, is would the switchgrass be considered an invasive species? And do the original plants and grasses need to be eradicated before transgenic grass is introduced? Um, so they're both very good questions. Um, would it be an invasive species? So um, um, we are um, engineering um, switchgrasses which are native to, um, um, to military ranges. And the, so, so, um, so it wouldn't necessarily be considered a, an invasive species. And the second question, would you have to eradicate the grasses? Quite possibly. Um, so uh, it might be necessary to, um, um, to, to, to remove some of the existing vegetation, um, but uh, you know, that's something that needs to be um, uh, further evaluated. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And how would you go about revegetating an active range with the transgenic grass? Oh, that's, you know, that, that, that's an interesting question because obviously an active range is not easy to, to get onto and, and not a, a, a place where you'd want to be um, um, and trying to uh, uh, plant plants. Um, so we've been taking, so our colleagues at, uh, at Erdic have been um, developing a technology to be able to aerially seed um, an active range, um, which they've been developing these seed balls that can be um, dropped either from a helicopter or from a drone uh, and um, are able then to um, become established, uh, can germinate and become established um, without having to physically get onto the range to plant them. Thank you, Neil. Um, many of the largest DOD ranges are located in the arid west, um, which are extreme desert or high desert environments. Um, 
has there been any research with phytoremediation in arid western environments in the U.S.? Um, so not that I'm aware of. I mean, this is challenging, and it's one of the um, disadvantages that I, I, I mentioned uh, at the start of my talk is that um, you know you can't do phytoremediation in areas where where plants don't um, uh, are unable to grow. So you know yes, um, um, that sort of area is, is challenging. I don't see this as a, a technology that's a panacea that's going to solve all the problems, but there are many uh, um, uh, sites where these types of grasses would be able to grow. Um, since grass pollen can travel over many miles, how would you prevent gene flow from the planted areas? Um, that's the first question, and then we also have a related question about whether um, when using um, modified plants, um, is there a risk that the, the introduced plant would take over from other species? Um, so, um, so with our current field plots, um, we are um, removing the um, flowers so that there is no pollen that's released. And um, so that was a permitting uh, condition for, for our permit. And so you know, that, that type of approach could be applied to small, um, small plots, small areas of land that need, that need decontaminating. Use on, uh, a, on, a, on a range, on, on a large area of land, um, clearly you cannot do that. You wouldn't be able to get on the range to, um, to remove the sea heads, to mow the grass. So, um, um, so pollen would, re would be released. And it's yet to be established whether um, gene flow is going to be an issue or not. So the pollen from the switchgrass would, of course, pollinate um, uh, switchgrass um, uh, outside contaminated areas and could introduce these genes to... Um, um, Plants, other you know, to other other grass species as well, and, uh, and and the risk of that needs to be to be established. There are potentially methods which this could, by which this could be controlled. Um, one approach might be to make um, sterile plants, sterile male sterile plants, so the pollen is not released, containing um, the genes to um, to the treated site. Um, could these plants become an invasive species? The only advantage that they have is that they can um, they can degrade RDX, and so they only have a selective advantage if there is RDX in the contaminated um, soil. So even with release of these genes to to other plants, those plants will only have a selective advantage if RDX is present in the soil. Thank you, Neil. Can you comment on potential regulatory challenges associated with applying mod modified plants in the field? So, um, so in terms of regulatory challenges, I think the, the, the biggest one is the one we've just addressed is, is, what's, is, is the issue about um, um, gene flow and how, how you might have to potentially control that. But um, as I say, that, that is a risk assessment that needs to be, uh, that needs to be performed and, and established. Um, but uh, other than that, uh, you know, we've we've been able to uh, get permits, uh, get a permit to carry out these trials, and so um, uh, I think the biggest issue will be gene flow. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, if RDX degrading bacteria are found in contaminated soil, and RDX is a rich nitrogen source, then why is it not completely degraded in situ? Yeah, that's a really uh, interesting question. There's some really nice science behind this as well. That um, so, you know, 20 odd years ago, it was very, very hard to find microorganisms that degrade RDX. Um, you can now go to any RDX contaminated site around the world and find these RDX degrading bacteria, and they'll have the gene that encodes for this enzyme XPLA. So this gene has moved around the world in in tens of years, um, which is quite um, which is quite remarkable. But clearly, it, these bacteria are unable to degrade RDX fast enough to prevent um, uh, migration of RDX into the groundwater. I think one of the reasons for this is that um, um, TNT is actually highly toxic to these bacteria, but importantly, is a potent inhibitor of that um, enzyme XPLA. And so, um, 
uh, and often TNT and RDX are co-contaminants on, on these ranges. So I think part of the reason for this is that TNT is, is slowing down that rate of RDX degradation by these bacteria. Got it. Thank you. And one final question uh, for you, Neil, before we bring back Elizabeth. Um, does the mineralization or sequestration of RDX or TNT um, make the plants more toxic to herbivores? Um, and that's an important question. So with, um, with RDX, um, you know, it's, it's, it's great because the enzyme is, is effectively the plants are mineralizing the, the RDX. And so it, it, there, is, there is nothing present within the plants as those um, um, experiments that I, that I showed uh, demonstrated. Um, with TNT, uh, the, the TNT, of course, is not broken down, and it's transformed, and it's sequestered, and it's sequestered in, in the roots. And it is important that we, we do, I think, herbivory experiments to show that um, these TNT-laden plants, which will be existing out there in the environment, uh, are, not, are, not, um, are not toxic to, um, to, to herbivores. I think it's very unlikely that they are because that TNT is not biologically available. It's actually incredibly difficult to extract that transformed TNT from the plant material. Um, so I, I believe what will be happening is that when the plants die or degraded, um, it becomes part of the humic material. But it's challenging to do those herbivory experiments because it's not going into the aerial parts of the plants. They're just contained in the roots. Um, but uh, it, those experiments need to be done um, but my feeling is that that plant material will not be more toxic to, to herbivores. Okay. Thank you, Neil, for the presentation and answering these questions. Um, and at this time, uh, we'll invite Elizabeth back and ask both Neil and Elizabeth a few last general questions. And the first question is for Elizabeth. Um, what do you see as the single largest threat to military lands, if there is a, a one? that you can identify, Elizabeth? Single largest threat to military lands. That's a tough one. Well, I think, and I touched on it during some of my questions, I think really it's overuse. Um, and I don't know that we have the technology in place at the moment to deal with the tempo of training that I suspect we will have on our lands moving forward and the um, the spread of, of the uh, new chemicals that could be uh, introduced. Okay, thank you, Elizabeth. And Neil, what do you see as the next steps in the research of phytoremediation of, um, of TNT and RDX? Um, so in terms of the next steps, um, we so our trials are just being done on on um, artificially contaminated soil in our field plots. I think the next step is now to do trials on um, on explosives contaminated soil uh, at um, uh, at a military site, uh, and then beyond that is to then get um, um, regulatory permission to. Um, and trial these plants out on uh, on much larger areas of, of land. Okay. And Neil, are we likely to see the same issues with the new insensitive munitions like NTO or um, DNAN? Yes, I think uh, absolutely. So, um, and importantly, work has been funded by 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 CERDIP to e evaluate the issues that that might arise. Um, when significant quantities of these new insensitive munitions um, are, are um, on, um, you know, um, end up on, on military ranges, um, with DNAN, I think we'll see very similar effects to um, uh, to TNT, uh, and I think with um, with NTO, we're going to have um, uh, significant problems with uh, with migration through soil because it's, uh, it's even more polar than than RDX, and so it will rapidly migrate through soil. So I think having plant systems that can address these right from the start would, um, would really um, help prevent these new um, insensitive munitions um, 
contaminating groundwater and, and moving off site. Great, thank you, Neil. And as one final question, um, Neil, Neil and Elizabeth, we would like to ask each of you what is the um, the one message that you would like to leave our audience with today. And uh, Neil, we'll start with you if you wanted to, to sum up your talk or, or identify just one thing to leave our audience with. Um, one thing I think is, uh, yeah, plants are remarkable at removing pollutants. And uh, um, through, uh, through our understanding of molecular, um, of molecular mechanisms of this, we can go on to breed plants, but also engineer them to remove not just explosives pollution, but uh, many other types of pollutants from the environment as well. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, and Elizabeth, what's the last message that you would like to leave our audience with? I think the, the big message is the, the challenge to DOD lands is huge. But the DOD is putting forward efforts and all the academic and industrial community are, are working to meet these challenges to uh, make our ranges and our lands sustainable for training and, and for the communities and soldiers um, for, for the future generations. Okay, thank you, Elizabeth and Neil, for the excellent presentations and for, um, for answering the, the questions and, and having the discussion with our audience today. Our next webinar in this third of ESTCP webinar series is on Thursday, August 17th, and is titled uh, Zinc, Zinc Nickel Dip and Brush Plating. And this webinar will feature two speakers from the Air Force Material Command and one from the Air Force Life Cycle Management Center. Registration is already open for this webinar, so please visit the CERTUP and ESTCP webinar webpage to register for this and other future webinars. And before we conclude, I would like to remind you that both the audio and a copy of the presentation of today's session will be archived on our webinar webpage in case you would like to refer to them in the future. We would appreciate it if you could take a moment to complete the survey that will pop up on your screen at this time. This concludes today's webcast. Thank you. <laughs>